Our final video in this chapter is going to concern box 2.1. So you see, as I said, when I, we started this chapter, that we're doing things in a different order than the book presents it. Box 2.1 is one of the earlier things that's presented in the chapter, but we're doing it last. So I'm going to turn now to that box. So here's box 2.1, entitled Environmentalism. The first row here, technocentric overlapping categories, and then ecocentric. The so the, tech, the point about overlapping categories is that there is some overlap between the cornucopian ideas and the accommodating ideas. So the cornucopians we have studied before when we talked about economic growth. The accommodating school is has some similarities with the cornucopian, but it's not quite extre as extreme. And then ecocentric care more about the environment than the technocentric schools. We have communalist and deep ecology. And along the rows, we have your green labels, type of economy, management strategies, and ethics. One could consider this either row by row or column by column. I think um, I think I'll do it uh, column by column. So let's do the cornucopians first. The green labels resource exploitative growth oriented position. So you want to exploit natural resources and you want to see that the economy grows where the economy is defined in a very conventional way type of economy, the book calls it an anti-green economy, unfettered free markets. The management strategies, the primary economic policy objective is to maximize GNP. Taking this axiomatic that unfettered free markets, in conjunction with technical progress, will ensure infinite substitution possibilities capable of mitigating all scarcity slash limits constraints, environmental sources and sinks. So you don't have to worry about the future of economic growth because it's going to be feasible because no important resources are going to run out with technological technological progress and free markets will be able to figure out how to continue to grow forever. Ethics, support for traditional ethical reasoning, the rights and interests of contemporary individual humans, that is not including future humans, just contemporary ones. The instrumental value, i.e. of recognized value to humans in nature. So there's no intrinsic value in nature. There is instrumental value in nature because nature is useful to us. Some parts of nature are useful to us. So to the extent that nature is useful to us, we'll value it, but we don't value it in and of itself. Let's look next at the accommodating school of environmentalism. Uh, green labels resource conservationist and managerial position. Type of economy, a green economy, green markets guided by economic incentive instruments, EIs, for example, pollution charges like taxes and so forth. So here clearly there are there's a recognition of resource constraints and pollution and a desire to control them using market-based mechanism. Me mechanism. Management strategies, modified economic growth, adjusted green accounting to measure GNP. So we discussed this before, things like the sustainable development indicators or genuine progress indicator, not just GNP. Decoupling, important, but f infinite substitution rejected. So decoupling means that we think we can have growth even if there are exhaustible resources. So the, exhaustible, the presence of exhaustible resources isn't coupled so strongly with economic growth that because the resources are going to be exhausted, economic growth is going to have to stop. There is some decoupling there. But infinite substitution is rejected. So it doesn't go to the extent to say that we can grow infinitely regardless of what resources are. Resources don't matter. The accom accommodating school does think that resources do matter. Uh, th they, don't, they don't matter as rigidly as some of the schools on the right, but they do matter, whereas the school on the left, the Cornucopian school, thinks that essentially resources don't really matter at all as a constraint to growth. 
Sustainability rule is the constant capital rule. So this is related to something called Hartwick's rule, which is that to have a sustainable economy, you want to keep capital constant. Now, here capital would include not only natural, uh, not only man-made capital, but also natural capital. And we'll talk more about this in chapter four. So therefore, some scale changes, in other words, um, you might have to limit the scale of the economy in order not to push too hard on the ecosystem or on scarce natural resources. Ethics, extension of traditional ethical reasoning, caring for others motive, intergenerational and intergenerational equity, that is contemporary poor people and future people. So intergenerational would mean that you care about contemporary poor people and intergenerational would mean future people. Again, the only value that's recognized in nature is instrumental value, not intrinsic value. So this ethical position is different than the ethical position of the cornucopians because it does take future generations into account and may put a special emphasis on caring for poor people. Okay, so next let's go to the communalist column under the, the e ecocentric category. Resource preservationist position, deep green economy, a steady state economy regulated by macro environmental standards and supplemented by economic incentive instruments. So steady state economy means a steady state of steady stock of human population and steady stock of of uh, man-made capital, um, macro environmental standards, things like uh, quotas or, or in cap and trade system caps on pollution, on resource depletion. Management strategies, zero economic growth and zero population growth. Now zero economic growth means not that the quality of the economy can't change, but that the quantity measured in some kind of physical way, its physical imprint and impact on the ecosystem uh, can't get bigger. Decoupling plus no increase in scale. A systems perspective, the health of the whole eco ecosystem is very important. Gaia hypothesis and implications so this, though, refers to the scientific Gaia hypothesis. Over here on the right, we'll talk about the non-scientific Gaia hypothesis. Um, in some sense, the Gaia hypothesis, and I didn't really talk about this in the previous um, video, can be illustrated by the fact that the atmosphere, that the composition of the Earth's atmosphere has been drastically changed by living things. So that it's not only that the physical environment affects biological things, biological things can also affect the physical environment. So that's one way of thinking about the scientific Gaia hypothesis. Again, the term decoupling here means decoupling um, economic growth to the environment. And here there's um, an attempt to do that so an attempt to grow, but still recognize environmental limits. Um, well, I'm sorry, there's no attempt to grow here in the communalist. So, um, but there's an attempt to keep the economy steady in the face of things like exhaustible natural resources. And finally here, ethics, a further extension of ethical reasoning, interests of the collective take precedence over those of the individual primary value of ecosystems and secondary value of component functions and services, that is component functions and services of the uh, ecosystems. I guess I didn't talk about sustainability labels. It's perhaps a rather obvious. The cornucopian school, very weak sustainability. The accommodating school, we've got weak sustainability. The communalist school is strong sustainability. And the next one that we're going to talk about is going to be very strong sustainability. So let's talk about the last column now, the deep ecology school of thought. Extreme preservationist position, very deep green economy, heavily regulated to minimize resource take. Uh, 
Management strategies reduce scale of economy and population. So this echoes Georgeshka Rogan's criticism of Herman Daly. Daly talked about the steady state economy with zero economic growth and zero population growth. And Georgeshka said that actually, in order to be sustainable, you have to reduce the scale of the economy, reduce the size of the human population. Scale reduction imperative, so that in some sense repeats what I just said. At the extreme, for some, there is a literal interpretation of Gaia as a personalized agent to which moral obligations are owed. Maybe I should even say to whom moral obligations are owed. So this is the non-scientific version of the Gaia theory or Gaia hypothesis. It's the more mystical, religious idea of Gaia, as the book says, as a as an agent to whom moral obligations are owed. So we owe something to Mother Nature. Ethics. Uh, acceptance of bioethics. Now, bioethics, um, the book uses the word bioethics in a way that's rather unusual. A more t common usage of bioethics, at least uh, in the US these days, is just the part of philosophy or ethics that talk about um, questions related to biology. And this can include things like uh, healthcare, questions of assisted suicide, and uh, how to take care of people when they're coming to the end of their life, where they have terminal diseases. But that's not the way your book defines bioethics. Your book defines it here, um, i.e., moral rights and interests conferred on all non human species and even the abiotic parts of the environment. So, abiotic means non living like a famous mountain or a famous cliff or a famous river that you value not just because they're living things uh, in the mountain but, but or in the river, but completely apart from the living things. The non-living thing has intrinsic value in and of itself. Yeah, so uh, to your in intrinsic value again. Int intrinsic value in nature, i.e. valuable in its own right regardless of human experience. And so you get very strong sustainability. So this is a uh, rather nice overview, I thought, of four different schools of ethical thought related to the environment.